Hello and welcome to episode three of the Amazon Unfiltered podcast. Today we have Scott on the show. Scott is the founder of Buyboxer, um, which is like a pretty large Amazon seller. It's like multiple eight figures right now, I believe. He also started Smart Scout and the Smartest Amazon Seller podcast. Scott, I'm super excited to have you on today. Hey, thanks for uh, having me. Perfect. So for today, I generally just like pick a topic, but for today, we're actually going to do a business dissection. Scott has a few interesting things going on. So instead of just focusing on one topic, I kind of want to get into the brain of the smartest Amazon seller and kind of see how he thinks about things. So Scott, I actually have a couple of questions for you. And I guess we'll start from the basics. I know you run both a wholesale business and a private label business. So how do you view each side of your business today? And maybe like, where are they at right now? Yeah, no, they're, um, I mean, they're both very uh, vibrant business models with, you know, hundreds and thousands of other sellers doing the, uh, something similar. Um, they're very different in the in their mindset of like what your, you know, goals are and how you get there. Wholesale, you're buying other branded products from either distributors or straight from the manufacturer. Private label, you're doing product development. You're trying to find a market of a product. Right. And uh, yeah, and, and, and then, you know, you, you're, you're, the, you're the exclusive seller, so you don't really have competition directly in your listing, but um, you got competition in your category. So you're wanting to position uh, really strong there. So I have done both and, you know, I, there's still is, there always, uh, right now there's absolutely opportunity on both. Uh, generally private label, higher margins, um, right. higher long-term value. Um, but uh, it's a little bit, it's more of like, a, there's a little bit more of a risk. Like, you know, did you, uh, did you win this market or not? You know, did you become a category leader? Um, whereas wholesale, you know, it's a little bit quicker to uh, get revenue. It's actually a lot quicker to get a lot of revenue. But, you know, there's a long term like risk where like, you know, at any given moment, a supplier can cut you off at any given moment, like competition can come in and, uh, you know, take some of your margins. Right. That makes sense. If you were like starting again today, which one would you go with? Um, well, like <laughs> starting again, knowing nothing and starting again, starting again, knowing what I know knowing now. What you know. Knowing what you know. Um, I'll tell you what, that's a great question. Um, I know I absolutely would go in private label, but I do think there's a lot of skills that take me to this space. What I probably would do if I was, uh, you know, starting over is I, I just like, I moved to China or like I would, I would become so close with like a, a manufacturer that, um, we would be developing something that is, that is a category winner at a price that just cannot be beat. So, um, I think, uh, you know, that's because, uh, anyone can just go to Alibaba and pick right, a product. Of course. Of course. I would try and take it one step further. You don't have to fly out there, but you've got to do some product development uh, to create a unbeatable um, product. Here's an example of how you can take a commodity. Um, a lot of stuff on Amazon are just commodities. Like, you know, there's five manufacturers that make the same thing. Right. And um, we have a few products that I think they would be dead uh, right now, except for the fact that we added value to it. So we have this, um, if you type in Able Skeever, it's a type of cooking, uh, you know, thing. We added a book to it, a cookbook, an Able Skeever cookbook. And um, the reason it, it, it's still around and it hasn't been like, uh, you know, beaten to death by, you know, cheap competition is because of that book. There's like a character inside of that. There, it, like when I bought the product myself, and started using it and following the book. I didn't actually make the book, but like that was part of the product development. Like I actually really enjoyed it. I was like, oh wow, this is awesome. I see these pictures, I hear the history of this. 
and I, and there's some recipes that were like, you know, within like 30 minutes, I already had like the, the cooked product. And so of course I'm going to give it a good review. That's kind of like the product development mindset that you need to do that. Like you need to um, create something that really has like long-term value. And I expect to be, you know, selling that product in five years. The, 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 the competition will come and go, but we will be always the one with the best little uh, cookbook next to our product. Right. That does make a lot of sense. And I guess kind of bouncing off that, how do you guys pick categories to launch in and how do you know which products to launch, especially since I know you've had like 100,000 SKUs across your career. So I'm just curious, like how yeah. do you make sheep those products? Yeah. So we, we've only done product development in like a, a maybe a, a dozen categories um, I don't think that it takes rocket science. Software helps, but it doesn't tell you everything. Um, actually, I think software is the best just to tell you about the size of the market. Um, and, you know, like, for example, like, hey, am I launching into a million dollar a month market or a 20 million dollar? That is a, a, a good decision to know um, up front. Um, because you don't want to like uh, invest everything just to find out that like, oh, this is like a really small market. No one really searches this. This is not a need by that many people because it is very hard to grow a market. Sure, it gets done. You could find people that have done it, but like I wouldn't expect to, especially on your first uh, few right. products. Um, you, you, you can... Um, you can disrupt an existing market, but like you kind of have to know the market that you're disrupting. When I say the word market, I may be like, you know, uh, I'm t sometimes I'm talking like a subcategory on Amazon, like, you know, uh, able skiver cooking pots or like uh, pickleball paddles, tennis rackets, though each of those are their own like market. Like, I don't care how good your product is. You're not going to make more tennis players. You know, right. people decide to play tennis for other reasons other than your product existing. So uh, that's what I look into. And then, um, you know, you just like really think, what do you think, what do people want? We, um, we had, uh, so this business already had some pickleball paddles. That's why I bring it up. It's a kind of emerging sport. And we're like, we can't win um, in this very competitive market. Unless we, um, unless we have some very specific ways to win. The way we did it is uh, what, what some products that have worked for us where we um, got really niched down to like colors. If people type in gold pickleball paddle, only like 50 people a month search it, but like we dominate it. We get every sale. So, um, or silver you know, pickleball paddle. We, we did a few like things to avoid the, uh, the super competitive, you know, race to the bottom. We, we don't have to race to the bottom if, if we have exactly what people are looking for in a, in a niche. And so that, that, those are a few ideas, um, that we look to. Um, if I were smart, I mean, this is uh, like, like you said, like if I were to start all over and, and basically have absolutely nothing and I'm selling on Amazon, I would just choose a category and just go all in. Um, it is dangerous to choose um, product categories that don't complement each other. I, here, an example that I would do, we, we, we consider doing this. We do have like one golf related product and, you know, it's just a little putting green. Well, I would, I would just keep, I would, I'd be like, well, let's get more putting greens, more like different styles. Okay. What's next? Oh, uh, there's this little game that people use for chipping. So you kind of have like these combos that kind of like create this accessory brand to golf. And I, I wouldn't leave that. I would, I would, I would I'd probably keep going into golf until I'm selling clubs, which it would be challenging, but I mean, there's a market for it. And, um, so that's kind of the, uh, the mindset that I would take, uh, you know, if I, if I were to start all over, it, it, it would take a long time to create a lot of value. Um, you know, a couple of years, whereas wholesale, if you want to make, you know, five, $10,000 in six weeks, you could do that a lot faster in wholesale. You, you can, you can scale up your business 
just a few, uh, you know, connect the dots. Sorry, I feel like I'm uh, jumping in the weeds, but like that, the, the, those are those are uh, business models that I work with every day, and that's how I see it. That makes sense. I know you have a tool that helps people do this, which you have very humbly not mentioned. So we yeah, can well, um, so um, after selling for eight to ten years, you know. Um, uh, I was always a software developer by trade. And so I, you know, I ended up launching a tool called Smart Scout, which um, it takes every brand on Amazon and kind of uh, gives you a bird's eye view. What is their revenue? And then it does the same thing for categories. So when we talk about, you know, it's like about each market, well, there's like 40,000 subcategories on Amazon and, we sh and Smart Scout will actually show you those top level revenues. So you can make those, uh, big decisions and really like understand like who's winning, who's losing before you even start. Right. That makes sense. And I guess what makes it different to all the other tools that are out there. So um, what makes it different really is that like there is no other tool that will give you like there's about a million brands on Amazon. We just hand them all over to you and show you here's how many products they have. Here's the revenue. Um, it's just very organized. And so if you have experience with like a Helium 10 or a Jungle Scout, those are great product research tools. I've learned a lot from them. We're more of a market research. So like, it's just like a, a you know, a one step up. Instead of just looking at one product at a time, we look at, you know, uh, whole swaths of products at a time. And, and within that, there starts to be a lot of opportunities. So we have like our wholesale arbitrage users who like look at a Lego and they're like, okay, here's this brand, but inside of this brand, here's the 20 products that I want to, um, uh, I think there's an opportunity here. All right, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess let's say we've gone through the entire process and we've launched a few ASINs. What's your process for actually killing these? Cause I know you have a pretty large catalog and I'm, you know, Sure, of course, so you're not paying the same amount of attention to each ASIN. So how do you know when to fill a product? Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you, um, you could spend your entire business, you know, an entire year on just five to 10 SKUs if you're talking about product optimization. Um, then when you start talking on, on the big scale that we, we served uh, uh, 100,000 ASINs, then you're kind of like, you know, um, you're thinking more about inventory management and, you know, sell through forecasting. Uh, you want to do those things at scale, um, you know, creating purchase orders in the, you know, uh, in the middle of the night, that stuff was happening. We, 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 we did build our own internal system to kind of forecast this all out. Um, that's not to say that like, you know, four or five SKUs, four or five ASINs isn't like a handful. You know, you talk to some uh, private label sellers and that's all they have is four or five SKUs and they could probably do five, $10 million on those. And yeah. they spend, they spend so much time uh, optimizing just endlessly and making sure that uh, these are the best products in their category. That makes sense. But let's say you're already doing like a decent amount of revenue, like two, three million, and you start launching new ASINs and you're not sure like how much bad performance to tolerate. Like when do you just know like, okay, this is enough. Let me stop spending on this or let me stop getting inventory for this. Or let me just hope this sells out organically so I don't have to waste more money on ads on this. What's your process for, I guess, kind of um, setting? Sure. I don't know if you can actually just like stop uh, using ads. Um, you can scale back. You can uh, focus more on defensive, but I, I I would never at this point right now with Amazon, I would not um, stop advertising. I think you know um, I I would focus on uh, you know advertising performance. Um, that's you know I, and everything kind of affects advertising performance. Your images, your you, uh, your primary image. Uh, no matter what your primary image is right now, you can still make it better. If that, you know, if you had a catalog of say a hundred SKUs, if you just focused on primary image 
and, and, and improved it, improved it and tested, A-B tested here or there, make something shiny, you know, add some texture to it, um, you know, test out putting the packaging with the product or without it, uh, you know, the way you do the shadows, all of that, you know, more and more do uh, customers make split decisions. And they make right. split decisions off of, you know, the price, the reviews, and the image. And if your image is like where you have the absolute most control and you can evoke uh, emotion and like you can, you know, Amazon has this really cool A-B testing. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the direction that I would go in. Right, that does make sense. I guess, what do you think about prioritization in that case? Because you have a bunch of ASINs running right now. Do you like just say like, you know, ASINs that produce 80% of revenue, you get 80% of like my attention or my spend or how do you kind of segment that? Out? Yeah, no, absolutely. That is that's a decision we've made like two or three times this year. We do make decisions based off of our capital. Like we don't have infinite capital, but we're like, do not stock out on these 10. This is where we make all our money. Sure, we have a like a roadmap or like a, a lot of other SKUs, but like, um, yeah, uh, let me put it this way. It's easier to take a good product and make it a great product than it is to take an average product uh, and make it good. Like, you know, it's easier to like whatever you've got um, that has success, it's easier to get more success out of that than it is to take something that doesn't have any revenue and to like kick it up to decent amount. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I guess I know you're big on tech. You know, you own a tech company yourself. So I'm curious what your actual Amazon tech stack looks like. What tools are you using? <clears throat> right. Um, right now, I mean, I've got a few, few different businesses, but uh, um, so um, I'm going to name names and like, not, I don't think all of these are best in class. They're just what I use. So um, Channel Max is a repricer. <clears throat> it's uh, very affordable, very configurable. I've used it for a decade um, and it can handle anything I throw at it. Uh, it other repricers, you know, I, there's some good ones out there, but you know, Channel Max, it works great. Um, so then there is, um, uh, there's a reimbursement tools. I I've used, um, Gatita and then also Sifted, uh, Sifted has a little bit better, uh, rates. I uh, Gatita, you know, just been really happy with those guys as well. Um, I, for, um, advertising software, I've used a lot and demoed just about everything. Uh, not everything, but I've demoed a lot. I've paid for sky. Um, I've paid for taking metrics, um, uh, Pack view and Perpetua right now with my private li private label business, we're using none of them. Uh, the main reason why we stopped was I felt like our advertising was getting lazy that, uh, we were not putting time into it and the software, uh, that we were using at that time, Perpetua, um, wasn't helping us like, you know, with like our, um, our specific variations, it was really hard and Perpetua to like, to, to spit out a campaign just for one variation and just to like go after like one type of keywords, but that's what we really wanted to do. And, and so that's, I just noticed that stuff wasn't happening and changing. So it's like, okay, let's stop using the software. Um, it was good. It gave us some optimizations to this point and let's start doing it ourselves. Um, I don't love doing it ourselves, but at least it, uh, you know, we, we make the, we, we are making the choices ourselves. Right. Um, then, um, inventory manager, I bought, you know, I built my own. Then, uh, we also use seller board. Uh, it's actually very affordable, uh, and gives some pretty good insights. That makes sense. So are you guys just doing all of your ads manually right now, like using bulk sheets or something? You have your um, I've got a few different businesses. Um, one of them that I don't really manage, like I, I, I am kind of involved with an agency. They do use uh, software. 
Whereas my private label business, we don't. And like, you know, I connect with my brother. He's very excited. He's getting better at managing ads. And like, I don't know if we're super interested. Um, that's not true. We would be interested. I just wanted to, you know, uh, wanted to really learn. Right. That does make sense. I know you have some interesting strategies for repricing. I know you do some repricing stuff around lunch yeah. and throughout the day. I think you do day parting repricing if that's the thing. So maybe you could tell us a bit of the strategies that are working for you today. Sure. <clears throat> I mean, uh, in short, the, um, uh, let's see, the, uh, the pricing strategy is just to like opt, you know, th this is might be wholesale specific, but I do know some of the stuff applies for private label. It's uh, the, you want to, you know, your profit margin is like the reason you're, you show up. So I think you should always keep uh, looking into your, pro uh, your prices. Um, what we would do is we would um, at the first time that we got in stock, we'd actually would just raise the price to see if sales come through. If they don't, then we start to lower it every couple of days. But if they come through, then we don't touch it. And, and so um, on average, our products kind of follow an arc at first, you know, very high margin. And then as they, if they don't sell, then we're like fine reducing our margin. But then we, if we start to stock out, we actually continuously grow our margin. We, we raise our prices towards the end. And this is, you know, a very dynamic way to our pricing. You know, we'll probably look at it more a few times a day uh, to see if we should uh, change or update. And um, it, it, it did make a material difference into our selling. And um, then there's additional tricks like you can introduce coupons. Not everyone actually uses the coupon. So um, it, it, it's kind of a cool little uh, area to keep uh, focusing on. How about like the pricing day parting stuff that you mentioned? Are you still like running that right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we price up at night and then probably price up once or twice during the day. And then um, outside of that, then we start reducing because like uh, the repricers that we use will often be competitive and reduce the prices. So we try and introduce a few times of the day where like we push the price up. Right, that makes sense. And are you doing the same repricing stuff for private label or is it just not worth it? We do <clears throat> on the tail end. We do the second half. Um, if we're, if we're predicting a stock out and we can't avoid it, we will raise prices um, higher and higher so that, you know, uh, we're stocking out kicking and screaming. Um, that doesn't work in every segment. Someone will be like, well, what about my organic ranking? Yeah, you're right. It could affect that. So, you know, maybe you don't want to do that. If you're not worried about that, if you actually have a, uh, a category leader product, sometimes you actually have pricing power. And the best time to leverage that is if you see a stock out and, you know, you really can at least get the most uh, profit margin at the end. Yeah, no, that does make a lot of sense. How about um, the internal tools that you guys have built? Are you still using those or is everything pretty much Um, uh, We're using a few of them. Not everything. Like I built like a shipment creator, um, stuff like that. But like, when the API uh, transitioned, um, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to transition every piece of software. I didn't want to support everything. And um, and I actually made this decision. I was like, if this is important enough to me, I'm just going to build it into Smart Scout, you know, a consumer um, web app, you know, where like it's just, it, it, it could work for a lot of businesses, not just ours. So, um, yeah, anything that like I've needed, uh, we've built in, uh, to smart scout outside of that, you know, just maintain a few things here and there, but like that new API update killed a lot of my, you know, uh, uh, years of coding, um, which, which is okay. Cause, uh, 
uh, we, we kind of moved on. How about this stuff you used to build back in the day? I know you launched by Boxer some time back and you were building tools for it back in 2012, 2013. After the tools we had today did not exist. What type of tools did you build back then? How did they help you with? Sorry, you're asking what types of tools did I build yeah, back for then? My boxer back in the yeah, day. Um, inventory management. That was the single uh, most important piece. Um, it was everything around the wholesale business model that we had with like, you know, that's the huge, large catalog. And then we had a lot of employees that were, uh, you know, creating shipments. So um, that was kind of like the chain that we created from forecasting, uh, orders, uh, shipping, and then sell through. Um, every piece of that was kind of a custom thing. I wish. Um, I had the foresight, probably the single biggest mistake of my life was, uh, uh, at least from a, a, a value creation was building that software in a, um, uh, in a desktop app environment and not as a web app. Um, uh, that would have been a lot of fun to have built it as a web app and start, you know, because there was no tools out there and I think we could have, uh, marketed it. Whereas today, you know, there's there's a lot of software, a lot of in, uh, in, uh, impressive stuff. And so, you know, people have a hard time making decisions. Back then, you only had like, um, when we started, the only tools that were on the market were repricers. That's it. I know it was super early. I think even the bigger tools, I think Helium started, Helium Time started at 2015, I want to say. I think 2016. 2016. Yeah, 2016. Yeah, so no one was around actually. That would have been pretty early, but yeah, I guess um, you know it doesn't always or it isn't always that clear at that point that it was going to be this big. And even for selling, like I don't think someone could start. I mean, obviously, someone will start a massive wholesaling business today, but it's a lot more difficult today than it was back in like 2010 or before 2010. Even most large sellers I speak to are just people that started their Amazon account in like 2005 or something. So I guess you could be early for one thing and not the other. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So actually, last question here. Um, this is kind of a difficult one, but if you could distill everything that made you succeed with Buyboxer into just three things, what would they be? Wait, did you say one thing or three things? Three things. Still oh, sure. Um, technology. Was a, was a big uh, game changer for us. Using it, uh, optimizing for it, because uh, you want, uh, that ultimately becomes a form of leverage um, where you can leverage your time and, and get more performance. Um, I think we had an aggressive mindset and I probably led that. Um, I, I only wanted to be a part of a growing business. And so we were trying to feed the fire, you know, and uh, grow at all costs. And um, not everyone has that mindset. And if I were to do it again, you know, maybe I'm a little bit older. I'm, I'm, uh, about to, I'm going to turn 40 next year. I probably would be a little bit more measured uh, to make sure um, uh you know, we don't grow too fast. I think, you know, we probably made a, uh, uh, a warehouse decision incorrectly a handful of times because of uh, that crazy, uh, you know, desire to grow. So, but like, then again, uh, um, you, you, you know, any, any new business, like you kind of do need that desire. You know, you need to like... Uh, be a little bit irrational. Um, most stories you hear, like say Apple, when they're launching products or whatever, like there's usually an irrational like will to like bend reality. And um, that, you know, we, we had that. Uh, so tech, um, what other advantage? Here's a, here's a, a Here's an odd one uh, to bring up, but it's relevant. If you're in the context of wholesale is we actually had a storefront. Um, 
my family had a retail storefront business, you know, uh, they sold toys and they sold, uh, you know, books. And the thing is, is that gave us a kickstart with a lot of relationships. Yeah. So, um, I, I guess the answer there is just to leverage what you have and what your network is. I, I do think that everyone has a kind of a different starting point. Not everyone's starting at the same, you know, point. Everyone has, you know, a different capital that they're starting with. Uh, and everyone has different relationships. Maybe someone has like, you know, more time than others. If you're, if you know, if you're in your young, your twenties, like you have time. And um, I have found out like time, I, I don't have uh, as much time. Um, with uh, with the, with a baby and wife, we uh, you know we uh, I have to hang up at five o'clock and that's it. So um, yeah, we I, I think you know using what you have and and learning uh, consistently will will help. Yeah, no, I mean I don't have a kid and wife, so I wouldn't know what that's like. But yeah, I do think in general, like whether it's for a buy box or not, it is just time. And timing, I think timing is super important. If you speak to like the top 1,000 sellers, I bet that most of them got started before 2015, just because the timing back then was better and just because it takes around 10 years to build something big. I also think it is intensity, right? Like the seller constantly launching new products, constantly getting like agreements with other brands to resell their stuff. So they're like constantly, constantly testing their listing content, their pricing, their advertising is just going to have to win in the long run. There's no way around it. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for coming on to the show today. Where can our listeners find you? Um, yeah, follow me on um, any social channel. I'm a little bit all over the place. I have a team that helps me, but usually it is me that's posting stuff. So um, Instagram at Smartest Seller. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, um, and I actually, where I probably do most of my like new insights or my newsletter. That's uh, uh, you know, if you just Google Smart Scout newsletter, um, you'll see, you'll see my weekly thoughts on where the industry is going. Great. Yeah, I'm actually subscribed to that one. It is really good. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on today and for the rest of you, I'll see you guys again next week.